Hi everyone, welcome to the Sacred Musings podcast with me, Phil Saker. It's episode 92, it is the 27th of July, 23, and today we are thinking about the corruption of our institutions. So welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Uh, yeah, thinking about something which has been on my mind and, and a topic we've sort of thought about on the podcast for uh, um, several times, which is the the way that our institutions seem to have become corrupted. And uh, it does seem like a lot of that has happened. So, you know, what should institutions be like? And, uh, you know, what's happened? And, you know, how has this kind of happened? So that's uh, that's something that we're going to be thinking about. Now, this is the um, the summer holidays. I know that those of you who are working, you know, if you don't have kids and, and what have you, then, um, you know, the summer holidays probably don't mean uh, very much. But... Um, uh, I just wanted to to to, to flag that up because um, uh, I know that people will be away and and what have you and it's I think I'll be you know running a little bit of a lighter podcast over the next few weeks just until September we are going to be away as well um, not for a couple of weeks so I think I'll, I'll do a podcast for the next couple of weeks but I just wanted to let let you know and I'll try and, and flag that up um, on the the actual um, days that I'm going to be away the weeks I'm going to be away. Um, now I normally start with a bit of news. There's not much actually to. It's it's funny. Last week was a you know there was a lot to say, and then this week there wasn't there wasn't so much. Just the way it goes. There was just one article that I wanted to mention, which was by Mike Yeadon. Um, Mike is someone who, uh, I mean, he's been you know in the news. What well, say in the news? Not actually in the the proper news, as in the main, mainstream news. They're not proper news, are they? But you know what I mean. Not in the mainstream news, not on the BBC or anything. Um, but he has, um, you know, since the early days of the pandemic, he's been calling out what has happened. And um, there was an an extract in TCW defending freedom. Um, of of um, he did a podcast with James Dellingpole, and uh, I thought it was quite an interesting read. It said Mike Yeadon on his epiphany as mankind faced evil. And he talks about how he came to to realise and, and understand what was going on as kind of the evil um, that it is. And uh, yeah, I thought it was it was a really interesting interesting read. And he talks a bit about going to church as a child, how he sang in, in a choir. Actually, you know, his parents weren't religious, but um, you know, as a a child, he he chose to go and sing in the choir at the church, and he enjoyed that. And he's kind of returned to that. Somewhat. So it's quite interesting how, you know, what's been happening over the last few years has led a lot of people back to their their roots in terms of faith and spirituality. Um, and um, yeah, something that I was talking about, um, you know, with the the, the rights have Fred song, you know, it's a spiritual war and uh, all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, um, do have a do have a look at that. I, I thought it was quite interesting. Um so, like I said, that's the only thing that I actually wanted to mention uh, this week. The only bit of news. Do let me know if there's anything that you have that you've read which you you find helpful. Um, people do mention books and things, and I, I've got some things on the list um, to read. So, uh, so thanks for that. Um, and um, yeah, uh, do do get in touch. Drop me a comment below on YouTube. Email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail dot com or Telegram. Um, the Telegram link is down below as well. And there's also a Buy Me A Coffee link if you'd like to support me. So thanks so much, everyone. And uh, yeah, I hope that you um, uh, you get in touch. Let's move on to think about the main topic, which is about the corruption of our institutions. Now, this is something that's been on my mind for a while. And it is a topic that we kind of have returned to uh, several times. But I, I suppose I just wanted to think more closely about it uh, today. And I was just thinking, you know, uh, um, I was thinking about our institutions and was just thinking, you know, has there been a single institution in our in our country, in, in the UK, which has not been corrupted in some way? Every institution, you know, the, the BBC for example, and much of the, the, the media, the mainstream media, the regulatory agencies like the MHRA, uh, the government even, you know, if you call the government an institution, 
schools and universities uh, and the church, which is the one which is most sad for me. And we'll come back to that uh, in a bit. But it seems like every institution has been corrupted and in some way influenced by this, what you might call woke uh, ideology. And I know that that's not always the best the best word to use but um, let's just for the sake of for the sake of argument let's just go with that for the moment so it seems like every institution has somehow uh, become corrupted now why is it that institutions are so important uh, why is it that institutions are important i think there are a couple of reasons overall reasons i think the first thing is that institutions support life so if you think about a bank for example you know particularly these days you know that we, we are not supposed to um no, you, you wouldn't just choose to manage all your money yourself would you by and large that you wouldn't take your money and put it under your mattress and, and keep it in a sock that you know banks are there that we entrust them with our money to steward and, and manage responsibly so that we'll um, gain interest, so that, um, you know, they will be safe as well. So, you know, a banking, the banks support life. They, they help, us, help us with life. Um, institutions also shape life. And you think about schools, for example, that an institution is not just there to, um, you know, to, to, to support what's there, but to, to shape and to to create what's there, and a school is there to um, to help uh, children grow up to be citizens, to help children grow up to be the the kind of people that we as a society want children to be. You know, to be yes, to have knowledge, but also I think to encourage them to be you know moral as well, and that's what schools should be doing. Um, so. Institutions have the power to, su to support, but more importantly, I think, to create. And of course, different institutions will, will fulfill different roles uh, within that. Um, the important thing is that life has to come first. Life has to come first. This is something which um, really struck me when we looked at John Locke and his second treatise on government. Uh, we did this a few months ago in case you, you missed it. But I, I thought this was a fascinating um, read, you know, from someone who was writing about 400 or so years ago. That the, I think his insight, or one of his key insights, is that the government is us, in a sense. That, yes, you know, we all, uh, we all have the right to, to certain things. And, you know, if someone, for example, steals our property, then we would have the right to to exact punishment. But he says that the government, we kind of delegate that responsibility to the government. So the government have a sort of delegated responsibility, but the government, it, ultimately, that its power derives from us, the people. You know, the government is not separate from the people. The government and the people are taken from the same stuff you know that the government isn't a separate thing and i thought that was really helpful that you know the government is sort of delegated responsibility on our behalf to govern on our behalf in the way that we would want the government to govern and that's the purpose of democracy isn't it you know that at the end of the day if the government are acting in a way which i disagree with then it's uh, you know we can um, vote them out that's the idea now, that's the case with the government. I think you could say something similar about other institutions as well. So if you think about a bank, for example, banks handle money on our behalf. You know, they, they take my money, they take your money, and they invest it and hopefully steward it responsibly so that they do make interest and so that they do keep it safe. So we delegate the responsibility for our money to the bank, to the institution. Schools, again, an important thing with schools is that uh, schools educate children on behalf of the parents, that the parents are the ones who have the actual 
responsibility for educating children but the schools do it on their their behalf if you like that it's again a sort of delegated responsibility so once again we see this the institution exists um not not for itself <clears throat> but with the responsibility that's been delegated to it um the bbc the bbc was famously set up by lord reith um or or um you know that he, he sort of had this vision of informing educating and entertaining so again the bbc um has a, a responsibility i suppose it's less a responsibility or it's a kind of a joint responsibility isn't it to inform to educate to entertain the responsibility is there to us to tell the truth and to to make sure that what is being said and done does inform and educate and entertain kind of rightly so that they have a sort of if you like a, a moral responsibility there and if you think about the church you know that the church as an institution and i would talk about particular denominations like the church of england in this that um, the church exists to preach the gospel and to make disciples and to facilitate that you know so that the, the church should ordain people who are going to preach the gospel the church should ensure that um, you know the, the message about jesus is preached from the pulpit and and it's not distorted uh, and so on so that there's the kind of the structure exists to support the mission of, of the church so there is the institutions exist to support life and you know i guess uh what what we um what we want to do as human beings you know that we want to educate we want to um you know make sure our money and, and possessions are safe you know we want to live life so the institutions exist to support that the institutions do not exist independently of people and independently of, of life they exist to support and, and as servants so that's fundamental so we've thought about what institutions are there for so what does it mean that they should do how should they act well fundamentally institutions are there to serve that's something which is really important the institutions are, are there to serve in the way I suppose that we've seen that leadership is there to serve. So what does that actually mean in practice? It means that they should uh, they should not stand over the people that they serve. You know, the institutions are not morally superior to people. You know, they shouldn't stand over the people that they that they um, are there to serve. But instead, they should seek the good and the benefit of those that they are serving so you know in the case of um, banks for example we have delegated our money to the bank it's the bank's responsibility to use that money in a way that we would approve of you know to invest it appropriately to invest it uh, so that you know kind of wisely not recklessly to make sure that our money is safe and, and so on and so forth of course banks haven't done that have they and uh, we'll, we'll come on to Coots uh, in a bit. But you think about even the financial crisis and how that was caused by banks acting recklessly. Um, they haven't done that. Um, but that's what they should do. They should seek the good and benefit of those they are serving. They should stand firmly on the truth. Um, that's another thing which is really important. That at the end of the day, institutions have a responsibility to the truth. Because they uh, they need to, to act in accordance with the way that things really are not in accordance with the way that they would like them to be um we'll come back to this in a minute but uh, yeah institutions need to need to stand on the truth they also need to act morally that is not to be coercive or controlling but they need to act ethically themselves um this is again something which many institutions fall down on and we'll come on to with some examples of this but it's the responsibility of an institution to act with morals and principles itself and that and also i think institutions should encourage us to 
act in a moral way. Um, not, not again, not coercively or co in a controlling way, but I think by having strong principles themselves and by upholding what's good and right themselves. So, um, for example, to give you the a BBC example, um, the BBC could do that by, uh, in its programming, actually wanting to uphold good moral values in its own programming and in its in its drama and so on you know so that doesn't mean always showing things which are fluffy and nice but that you know everything comes from a kind of strong moral perspective and we spoke a little bit about this um a few weeks ago when we were talking about harry potter and the, the I, I as i see it the problems with um harry potter i think a much more morally ambiguous universe but if something comes from within a strong moral framework uh, that's different and that's how the BBC could, could do that. So what happens then? That's what institutions should do. What happens when institutions go wrong? Uh, I think um, a variety of things happen. Um, one thing is that people are seen as a potential problem. There's a sort of them and us mentality, in other words. So the, the institutions start to see themselves as being separate from and above the people that they are there to serve. So the institution becomes divorced from the people and from, from life. Uh, it becomes a separate thing. There's that kind of them and us mentality. It means that, therefore, we, the people, need to be coerced and controlled rather than respected and persuaded. Uh, so the institutions, you know, are there to wag the finger and scold us and actually channel us in in what what they see as the right ways. Um, so, you know, we're there to be herded like cattle, really, rather than, um, you know, treated like human beings. Um, and And therefore kind of tied to that the truth is just an inconvenience um i think this kind of is is parallel really that uh if you if you see people as the problem then you know you can be uh any narrative which comes which is sort of like climate change for example which is you know like a religious uh apocalyptic narrative you know the world the sky is falling the world is ending then you know what we need to do is we need to control you to solve this problem. It doesn't matter what the truth actually is. You know, that actually you are the problem and we, the institutions, are here to solve it. You just need to be, to, to go along with it. You need to be compliant. Um, so, yeah, the truth kind of goes out of the window. That it, it's just a matter of needing to control people uh, to solve whatever problem that they've concocted. And uh, kind of to top it all off, morality is thrown out to serve the greater good or, you know, their understanding of the greater good. Um, this is an important one that rather than institutions behaving in a moral way, they seek to do what they believe is moral, the greater good, by using wrong methods, i.e. by controlling coercion, manipulation, uh, all of those kind of things, not treating us fairly and rightly and justly, and we're true. So th there is a kind of a greater good, but actually it leads to these institutions acting in a very immoral way. And there are loads of examples of this. Um, I mean, you, you know, we'll, we'll look at some examples in a moment, but um, one example I think is um, in the Church of England, sadly, that you know when the, when the, the the bishops want to to make a change instead of putting the change to general synod and, and having votes they they think well we could just make the change as the bishops we'll just go behind closed doors there won't be any transparency or openness and we'll just make these decisions and uh, you know that a lot of people have picked up on this that it's not happening you know things are not happening in an, in a transparent way so if someone has started up a a drill or something outside so i hope that you, that doesn't come across too loudly 
So what happens when institutions go wrong? Let's look at a few examples of this. One example, the first example is Coots and the debanking of Nigel Farage. Um, obviously, this has been in the news recently and um, Dame Alison Rose, the uh, CEO of uh, NatWest, um, has been forced to uh, to resign. So, you know, it, it, it's hit the news and I think a lot of people have realised that what they did was wrong. But uh, nonetheless, um, if you look at the decision that they made, this was last November when they had a meeting about Nigel Farage, um, they came up with this sort of dossier of all of the alleged crimes that he'd committed. But, you know, you ask the question, had he actually acted in an immoral or illegal way? No, he hadn't. It was all this sort of suggestion that he might have been, you know, seen to be xenophobic and racist and, and all of that. But there was no actual, you know, demonstration that he was any of those things. It was just, you know, this almost sort of Twitter level um, thinking behind it. You know, sound bites rather than actual, you know, careful ethical thinking. And if you think about it, you know, Coots in the past have handled money from mafia dealers, from, um, you know, um, dictators and, and, and what have you. They haven't they haven't had ethical principles like this in the past. Uh, but Nigel Farage comes along and suddenly he's persona non grata because he believes in in sort of more conservative traditional values. And, in, you know, in Brexit, it's incredible, really. Um and and Coots have they behaved uh, so that you know they 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 haven't treated Nigel Farage fairly, but have they behaved morally as well? And again, this is why Alison Rose had to resign because uh, she leaked personal information to the press, and and then uh, misinformation, as it turns out. So it was personal information which shouldn't shouldn't have been leaked in the first place. But it also turned out to be misinformation that they, Coots didn't debank Nigel Farage because his account dropped below a certain threshold, but it was because they, um, uh, of of this sort of poli political decision. So Coots haven't behaved morally either. So we can see. I mean, this is just one example, but how the banks have acted, uh, just in a very corrupt way. They. They um, treated someone very unfairly and they lied about it, basically. Um, think about the BBC and the recent coverage of climate change. And I think we mentioned this last week as well. But the way that they've been exaggerating the hot temperatures and all of the weather maps are covered in red, you know, to kind of try and scare people into thinking that we're in the middle of a terrible crisis. Um, so that you know they haven't fairly represented the data or you know thought about other other things going on or you know try to give the wider picture like the fact for example that cold kills more people per year than than heat um, but they've tried to manipulate to in order to promote a particular uh, narrative so the BBC are corrupt as well and, w and we've seen that and then the final example I put is schools and LGBT plus issues like the promotion of pride, um, for example. And I think I mentioned this on um, the my interview with uh, Julian in the, the Mind Renewed a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, a, um, a, a school I, I know of, some um, friends of ours have got um, children at the school, or one child at the school, had a pride week promoting diversity and, you know, my friend is um, visually impaired, so he has, of course, an interest in, uh, you know, he knows how difficult it is to, to get around being a visually impaired person and how important it is for institutions to kind of recognise that and, and to make provision. But, of course, this diversity week, it wasn't at all about diversity in any way other than sexuality and transgender. And they were teaching about you know, children being assigned a gender at birth and, and all of that sort of thing. And again, you know, are children being taught fairly and supported, you know, help to encourage to flourish in the right ways? You know, no, they're not. 
there's no there's no commitment to the truth there's no commitment to them it's you know that people have to be herded like cattle into a particular road because that's the that is the right road to go down they believe so those are three examples of um, institutional corruption but I mean we could just be we could be here all day if we were to go through and I'm sure that you can think of many more just off the top of your head if you've been following the news over the last few years now where does all this corruption come from and I think it's important to make the point that this corruption comes from the top can you blame institutions for acting immorally for treating us as if we're the problem and we need to be controlled for not being committed to the truth but to the narrative i mean can you blame institutions for all of that stuff when this is how those in charge those in government have been acting that when the corruption goes right to the top then it's not a surprise that other institutions are acting in this way now you can hardly blame them can you and um, i apologize those those of you who are watching this on on youtube i've put a picture there of matt hancock um matt hancock uh, when i see a picture of him it tends to make me angry so i do apologize <laughs> or when i see anything by him um but but this is the thing isn't it you know here's a guy in government who has not told the truth who has just given money to his mates who has you know had an affair he hasn't acted morally he's you know just been i mean really um done some pretty terrible things and he's in government you know he's one of our elected representatives he is one of our leaders and if you think about think about it in in those terms you think well it's hardly a surprise when coots and with other institutions are therefore acting in the same way is it you know why why should we expect any different from the rest of our institutions if those at the top um act in this way and actually this is something which um the bible makes clear and you know just as we're just as we're coming to to the end of this section um i just want to quote you from a passage from two kings this is 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 to 9. And this talks about a king in the um, the Old Testament called Manasseh, who was a king of Judah. And he was one of the last kings before they were taken off into to exile. And he was pretty bad. So let me read you about what, what he did. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hepzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father, Hezekiah, had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple, of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, In this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them, and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen. Manasseh led them astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. Okay, so this is saying that it was Manasseh who did evil, that he started worshipping other gods. He it said he, he worshipped all the, the starry hosts, you know, he worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars, and that, that was common in, in those days. But God had commanded the people of Israel not to do. 
and he consulted mediums and spiritists. So you know, effectively, he he changed the religion. He abandoned the religion, the traditional religion. He changed it to you know the what was then the kind of the pagan religion of you know the starry hosts and the um, mediums and spiritists and omens and and so on. All the, the religion of the ancient Near East. That was just what the the tradition that 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 went on then. So he made made the people just like the surrounding nations and he led the people astray. That was the thing, that as he did that, he led the whole people astray. And you often see this. Uh, it's not often spelt out in these terms, but um, you do often see this in the books of Kings, that the people of Israel or the people of, of Judah, they get a, a good king and the, the, everything would go well. But then they get a bad king and things would go off the rails because the king would, you know, lead them astray. And I think that we do have to lay a greater part of the blame at our leaders, at the government in this, because they have abandoned the traditional religion of, of Christianity. They've abandoned that and they have replaced it with this kind of new secular religion of let's call it wokeness again and they uh, and in doing so they've led everyone else astray and that is that's why we're in the mess that we're in at the moment because they have led the people astray and yes the people do have responsibility of course but i think the greater part of the blame is with the leaders and i think that's what we see that it's so important for for leaders to be you know to, to to act kind of rightly and be examples and you know you can hardly expect the institutions underneath the people to act rightly and morally when they see their leaders um acting so so wrongly and um and i'd just like to finish this section by asking the question where is the church in all of this because this has been one of the biggest disappointments for me, uh, and perhaps you too, over the last few years, that the church should have been there to to proclaim, you know, sort of a better way, if you like, should have been there to to actually say, you know, we are going to, um, you know, to do what's right. We're going to stand up against all of this. But that hasn't happened, has it? You know, it hasn't happened. The church has just been nowhere. And um, it, it's it's been a huge disappointment to me that, you know, the one institution which should exist, you know, under God to, to stand up for what's right and what's true and to be an example has just looked the same as the rest of society, has just taken on the same problems that um, m or many of the same problems that the government have. It's taken on many of the same problems that the rest of our institutions have. And we now have in the Church of England, you know, the Church of England kind of going down the climate change road and, you know, other things too, transgender as well to some extent. Um, and we looked at this in the podcast um, a few weeks ago. But this is how it, this is how it is that the church has become, certainly that the church has become corrupted too, as the kind of the, the institution, the Church of England and other denominations um, but the good news is that, you know, it's God's church in the end, that there is only one church and uh, that will remain the same, whatever the human institution, um, whatever happens to the human institution. So that's a bit of good news to finish with. Um, but um, yeah, I hope that that's I hope that this has been thought provoking anyway for you. Do let me know what you think. Let me know in the comments, uh, leave me a telegram message or email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com. I hope there's been something there to spark a bit of thought and uh, just to be thinking about, about our institutions. And perhaps it, it gives, you know, if you're part of these institutions in one way or another, thinking about how we can uh, make a difference, what we can do as well. Um, you know, being governors, being, you know, leaders in organisations and institutions, how we should act and uh, how we should seek to be. So let me finish then with a reflection from the Bible. And um, I think I mentioned last week I've been reading through 1 Chronicles. 
and uh, I came across this um, passage uh, yesterday and this is um, it's very much like a psalm it was sort of for the um, the dedication it was um, the, what's the context it's oh it's when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and David did that he, they David kind of um, of course you know succeeded Saul and um, he then brought the uh, eventually brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem he you know kind of um, uh took Jerusalem and brought the Ark of the Covenant in and then this song or this sort of psalm was um, sung when they brought the the Ark in and I think it's I think it may actually also be a psalm I, I, it's very I can't um, I haven't looked up actually what the what psalm it is or whether it's sort of a compilation of different psalms or, or what it's very similar but let me just read you anyway the last little bit from it the whole thing is is worth reading but I just wanted to read the last little bit so this is um, from verse 31 of 1 Chronicles 16 let the heavens rejoice let the earth be glad let them say among the nations the Lord reigns let the sea resound and all that is in it let the fields be jubilant and everything in them let the trees of the forest sing let them sing for joy before the Lord for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Saviour. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. So this is... A, um, a psalm uh, and a song all about you know praising God and um, for what he's done but what I was really struck by with this was how it says you know the let let the um, the earth be glad saying the Lord reigns and um, saying let the the trees of the forest sing for he comes to judge the earth now this is something that I I probably read these words or similar words many, many times before everything that's happened with with COVID. And I don't think I really understood them. But when you're living in days when there is so much injustice in the world, now when you're living in days when there is so much wrong, then it's a deeply wonderful thing that there is a judge, isn't, isn't it? When there's so much injustice... And I was thinking a little bit about um, Bob, the, the cartoonist, and how I just feel like Bob is, and, and perhaps other people too, you know, that they see all the wrong in what's happening. But I think they've just become very bitter about it all. And I, it's so important for that not to happen. It's so important, actually, to, to not get bitter about everything that's happening but remember that there is a judge and to rejoice in that and I think that's the antidote to bitterness actually to say you know yes there is so much wrong that's happened and there is so much wrong in 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 the world but you know we have to rejoice that there is a judge and he will come to sort everything out and we need to entrust it to him I think we looked at uh, was it Romans chapter 12 the other week which was uh saying you know do not take revenge uh, my dear friends but leave room for god's wrath you know for it is written it is mine to avenge i will repay and that is the thing that at the end of the day you know god is better at repaying than we are and he will repay in time so when we look around the world and we see all of the, the injustice that's happening and we are of course deeply worried about that we can rejoice that there is a, a judge who will come to judge the earth. So that's just how I wanted to, to leave it there today. Uh, let's take a moment to pray about all of these things and uh, yeah, ask for, for God to change. Uh, not for God to change, but for God to change the world. So Heavenly Father, we pray for our institutions which have become um, corrupted 
at the moment and we can see so much corruption in the world uh, right now we can see the ways that things are not uh, the way that you want them to be lord and uh, we pray that you would bring healing and bring health to our institutions especially from the, the top down from the government uh, down and we ask lord that you would cause them to act in a right way in a, a moral way a principled way that they would be committed to the truth they would be committed to service and uh, we pray lord that you would help us as individuals perhaps whatever role we have in institutions to be people who are committed to service and to truth and justice and that we pray lord that you would um, help us to have confidence in you and to rejoice in you coming as judge uh, knowing that although there is so much evil and wrong in the world at the moment that we can trust that you are a god who judges justly and rightly and that you will sort things out in your timing uh, so we pray that you would help us not to be bitter but uh, uh, entrust all of that to you. And so we ask, Lord, for your help for us uh, in these months, and we pray that you would light the way forward and help us to be a light in our uh, friends, families, communities, in every respect. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. A um, little bit of a shorter uh, episode i think but i hope it's been helpful um do let me know if there's anything that you'd like me to look at in the podcast as well i think i've had one or two ideas about that um but uh, yeah i'd love to hear from you on that too um all the details down below um i think that's uh, that's everything to say so yeah in the meantime i'll see you again soon I'll be back next week but in the meantime god bless